Looking back at your time at the European tour, uh, the expansion of kind of going from a European quote unquote tour to a world tour, yeah. looking back, is it pretty amazing of how big it's actually gotten, even from the time period you played from most of the events being in Europe to now, you know, besides events in the States, it's literally a world tour at this point. Well, I mean, I don't think anyone would argue with the fact that, you know, European tour should have changed, you know, if, if this is going to sound a little controversial, but in my mind, European tour should have sat down with the Asian tour, the Sunshine tour, you know, uh, uh, Japanese tour, and they should have formed, really, they should have formed a World Series. And I think that what should have happened, um, you know, they should have created a sort of, you know, 60-man field, you know, and, and do some sort of, I don't know, qualifying to get into that 60-man field and there is your World Series, because it could truly have been a World Series um, outside of America. I mean, we all know that no one can touch America. The PGA Tour is an incredible, you know, vehicle. Um, you've got over 30 million golfers in America. You've got over half the golfers in the world in America. So, you know, we're never going to be able to deliver a tour at your level. But what we could have done was created a, a tour outside of America. Um, but I think there were just too many people that wanted a seat at the table and didn't want to give up their 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 place, you know, um, you know, from an official sort of standpoint. Um, and, and it never happened. But the European tour under Ken Schofield did an incredible job of sort of first of all bringing us to the Middle East, you know, back in the late eighties. Um, you know, then we ventured down to sort of South Africa, you know, and then we started venturing into Asia and doing co-sanctioned events and this type of thing. And I, I think that he did a phenomenal job, as did Georgia Grady behind him. Um, I think that they maximised the opportunities that were there. I just feel that the European tour is really a name that should go at this stage because it's not European. It is, you know, it is very much an international tour. Um, I, got, I don't know how many countries we go to, but it's quite a lot. And I think that, you know, what would help us is if we named it, I don't know, the Sony Tour or, you know, you, know, you sold the name of the tour right. and you, you sent it around the world for commercial reasons. I think that would make sense. And then I think that the, the tours, the Asian Tour, Sunshine Tour, European Tour could be a feeder tour to that World Series so you're still not losing your identity as European tour or Asian tour or Sunshine tour or Japanese tour. You, you keep your, you maintain your identity, but having a, a true World Series could easily have been achieved, I think. And I'm a little bit surprised that it hasn't happened to date. I think it was also great for the European tour for exposure in the States is when they put it on the Golf Channel over here, right? It was hard to watch or get coverage mm. before that. Now it's always on in the morning. Right. So, I mean, it's a huge following over here of you wake up on Saturday morning and live golf's right. on. It's been fantastic from that standpoint, too. So the brand is definitely expanding. And, and yeah. you know, it's from that standpoint, it really does feel like, a like you said, what you're saying kind of makes sense or almost kind of like the idea what Greg Norman had back yeah. in the day of being in a really elite field with really great names. And then you sort of use those other tours as like a, essentially like a web.com qualifier. It could have been really interesting to see out of all those tours, those top 50, 60 players going at it at great venues across the world, mm. right? That would, that would sell. I, I mean, think I think it'd so. be fascinating. I, I think so. And I also think that, you know, what we also need to, to really look at um, just being objective about it is, you know, I think that, you know, having sort of 45 tournaments a year or whatever it is, I think it's too much. You know, for me, I think that having a, a having a, a smaller season, like a 30-tournament season, a 30-week tour or 35-week tour as a maximum, would create more quality. Um, you know, a number of times, you know, we have tournaments which you don't, you know, I'm sad to say it, but we go to you know some countries where you don't have a great deal of spectators, and from a viewing or you know if you're a sponsor looking at it, you'd go, hmm, you know this doesn't look overly successful. Whereas when you look at the states on the PGA Tour or the Champions Tour, it's rammed every week, 
and that is attractive as a sponsor. It's attractive as a viewer um, on TV. But, you know, when you're watching somebody walk his dog and, you know, three kids playing by the side of the fairway and, and someone having a sleep and there's nobody else in the picture but a couple of, uh, you know, um, promotional boards, I don't think that's particularly attractive. And I think that the European Tour may, I think that they should look at, you know, reducing the number of, of tournaments. And I think that would encourage a few of the big, bigger names to play a little bit more often. Um, as it is, you know, they all play the same group of events and, and you don't really help out on some of the smaller tournaments. And ultimately, if you were a sponsor trying to get work your way into the tour, you want to try and get as good a field as you can. And, and often, you know, they can't achieve that. So it's a toughie. I'm not saying, you know, I'm, it's a very difficult job that, that uh, Keith Pelly has and, and no one's saying it's easy. But I think sometimes you've got to try and be a little bit more strategic um, as to as to how to better what you know the product that you currently have. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's their job 24/7 to try and better it. But sometimes you've got to make changes that are tough. 2002 Open Championship at Muirfield. You were you were right there and great round on Sunday shooting 65. Mm -hmm. What's that pressure like uh, for playing in, for what I think is the greatest trophy in, in golf, the greatest championship in golf, the Open Championship, and then to have uh, have that moment on such a great golf course like Mirrorfield, which I know a lot of players say is probably the fairest and the best in the Rota. So just kind of encapsulating that whole, that whole situation right there for that championship on that golf course – Looking back, sort of, what is your memories or, or thoughts about that that day on Sunday and the championship in general from from two thousand and two? Yeah, I it was. I knew I was going to play well uh, Sunday. I played with Sergio on the Saturday through the eye of that storm. I mean, through the worst of that storm. Um, and I played at Warson on Saturday. I was level par through fifteen and. <clears throat> you know, I was a little bit tired towards the end of the round, and I dropped. You know, 16, 17, 18, I made bogey each hole, which was really sad after I'd done the work that I'd done prior to that. If I'd have walked in with 72, I think I'd have beat the average score of the field by five. Uh, but that didn't happen. Um, Sunday, I, I knew I was going to play well, felt good. Uh, put a new putter in play on Sunday, put a different driver in play on Sunday, um, even. And because I wasn't happy with the distance I was hitting it on Saturday, and I didn't feel that I hold enough putts on Saturday. And I went out Sunday and uh, um, I think part of the first, and then went birdie, 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 and uh, and then par five, and then uh, I birdied six, seven, eight. I par nine, and then birdied ten and eleven. And I think when I, ho I hold a monster putt on ten. And I walked over to my caddy and I said, what the hell is going on here? And um, he says, I don't know. He says, but just keep doing it. And uh, I flushed it up 11 and hit 9, 9 to 8 foot and knocked that in. And, and I just told him to don't stop talking to me about anything but golf. Do not leave my side and don't stop talking to me about anything but golf. And we talked, I don't know what we were talking about. I have no idea. Um, but made a really good up and down at 13. I missed the par three right and uh, chipped up stiff. At 14, I hit flush two iron, seven iron, right down the barrel, 20 feet short of flag, hit a real good putt and tapped in for par. 15, I hit flush three iron, flush eight iron to eight feet, uh, to four feet above the hole um, and it was a really fast putt and I touched it and it caught the lip of the hole and kind of spun out about four feet past and it was the first time I started shaking over a putt and uh, but I hold it and then I went to 16 the par three six iron flag from middle left uh, behind the bunker caught it a little bit thin uh, I was hitting it to the middle of the green and it was about eight, nine yards up the green, and it fell back off the green and fell 
a good 10 yards short of the green, which left me a really difficult pitch over the bunker. Um, and I hit 52 degree wedge, just soften the club face. I mean, I can still feel it. I can still see it. Um, I hit this most perfect of pitch shots, landed a couple of checks, ran right up to the edge of the hole, stopped quarter of an inch from going in, middle of the hole, tap in par, walk to 17, flush drive up the middle of the fairway. And for a split second, as I walked off the, the uh, tee, I suddenly thought, Christ, I'm going to win this. And then as soon as I thought it, I tried to unthink it because I knew I'd got ahead of myself. I just went, oh, stop, 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 like this. Anyway, I walked up the fairway, get to it. I got 256, the flag, pin cut, middle right. It's a perfect forward. Aimed at the left edge of the green, and I just got a little bit short with my backswing and threw the hands at it on the downswing and pulled it, hit a straight pull. It wasn't a hook, it just pulled it. I thought, like, oh, damn, you know. It was an easy birdie, uh, really. Um, and uh, I've pulled it into the rough. And I said to Dom, come on, we'll take a slow walk up there. Anyway, we get up there, no ball. No one's found the ball. Um, so we start looking. And we find five golf balls. And the fifth ball we find is a Titus 2 Pro V1. Um, but no mark on the ball. And then the referee turns around and says, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go back, back and drop. So I said to Dominic, give me a ball and the forward. And he says, no, I'm coming with you. I said, just give me the ball and the forward. He says, no, I'm coming with you. And he walked with me the whole way back down the fairway with the golf bag on his back. And uh, he says, come on, he says, just knock this on the green. He says, we can still do this. And <clears throat> I stood there and I flushed the forward onto the left side of the green. And walking up there, I said to him, I'm going to hold this. And uh, I said, I am going to hold this. And uh, I promise you I'm going to hold this. And I said like three, four times. And we walked up there. I marked the ball, put the ball back down. I walked all the way around to the other side of the hole. So I'm putting it from the hole side. And I can hear my heartbeat going. It's, it's like so loud, my heartbeat. And it's going like, like a train. And I'm trying to calm down. I'm trying to take in air. I'm trying to breathe. And I walk back around, and it was a double break. It was um, right to left and left to right. And uh, as I put the putter down behind the ball, I could see the putter head shaking. And I thought, oh, God. And so I kept the putter a further sort of inch away from the, the ball just in case I touched it. And I looked at it, went through my routine, two strokes, looked up put the putter behind the ball, looked up, and then hit it. And it went straight in the middle of the hole for a par. <laughs> and the, and the, you know, from probably from 50 feet at least. And, I mean, I just, you know, the eruption of joy. Um, because, you know, from a, an emotional point of view, for, for two hours, you know you're there. You know you've got it in the palm of your hand. And you're trying, you're trying very hard to to make it just another day. You're trying to make it as calm in your mind as you possibly can, and that's why I was having him talk to me about anything but where we were actually and what we were actually doing. And um, and as I walked off the green, um, I mean the noise when the when the ball went in was crazy, and you know my nerves are gone then at this point. Walking out towards the 18th tee, there was this old woman. I'd say she must have been 75. She was an RNA member's wife. And I was walking between the, you know, the, uh, the, the galleries and and, and um, I had my head down trying to sort of get back into the zone, so to speak. And this woman was literally down on her knees and she swore at me. She said to me, she says, come on, Gary, you can effing do this like this <laughs> bless her so I uh, I walk out into the 18th fairway and there's a good short 70 80 yard walk back to the 18th tee and I just I, honestly I just couldn't calm down and I you know it was my tee shot and uh, I was second to go and um, and unfortunately, I made the same swing as I did in the 17th fairway the first time around. And this time, rather than throw my hands at it, I blocked it. Um, and I blocked a two-iron 
right into the semi rough, had a bad lie. Um, I got a jumper hook with a nine iron, went into the crowd, into the stands. I got a free drop. I then hit a wedge from sort of 100 yards to just off the right edge of the green, about 18 foot from the hole. Um, and then a little chip and run with a seven iron, which edged the hole and went eight foot past. And obviously walking up there, I knew I had a two shot lead. So effectively, I got this eight foot putt to win the open. And that's what it was in my mind. Bearing in mind the leaders at the start of the day are two hours behind me. Right. So I'm posting the score. So here I am, you know, can I post? And um, I think Peter O'Malley had posted, he might have post, I can't remember the number I was on. I think he might have posted 400. I might have been 600 at the time. I can't remember something like that for the, the tournament. And, um, and it was two inches outside the left break. And my caddy just tapped me on the shoulder. He says, come on, son, knock it in. And, uh, you know, I was shaking like a leaf. And I hit it, and I hit it flush, and it went in the middle of the hole. And I can honestly say I've never been so relieved in my entire life to get off a golf course. Um, I don't know how. You know, that was the scariest um, experience. Um, enjoyable. I learned a lot about myself. Um, but when you see really the greats, the Tigers of this world, you know, the Nicholases of this world, the Watsons of this world, the Justin Roses and what have you, and Mickelsons, when you see them week in, week out, hit these incredible golf shots under pressure, I don't really think that people realise just how hard it is to do that. Really, it's so difficult to... Um, to perform at the levels that some of these guys performed at on a regular basis. I mean, I know, obviously, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it, and, you know, that, that stands to reason. But nevertheless, it's difficult, let me tell you. It is difficult, um, you know, and I've got such an appreciation and a respect for, for those guys. And, um, you know, I gave it a run, and ultimately I was one shot shy of the playoff. Um, and I don't know that too many people that have lost the golf ball on the 71st hole of the major championship. Um, but, you know, that's the way the cards were dealt, and I had, to, I had to play them. Hey, it's Jason from the Sub-70 Podcast. If you are looking for new irons in 2019, uh, check out www.golfsub70.com. Uh, forged irons, multi-material game improvement irons. We kind of have the whole gamut all handcrafted in Sycamore, Illinois, exactly to your specifications with factory direct pricing. It's a little bit different, but sometimes different isn't necessarily bad. So expectations redefined sub-70 golf. When you have a, you know, like, like you're walking on a tightrope with that kind of pressure and the emotions, it, is it fun or is it more nerve-wracking or is it a combination of like, you know, us, we'll never... The most action we get is a you know a twenty dollar putt after the end of the day, and it's still you know your heart pounds in it. That's the fun part of being in the situation. Sure. But when it's at that level, is like do you instantly want that adrenaline adrenaline rush back again? Is like is it or is it something that holy cow that was exhilarating, scary, fun, everything it was, you thought it would be, and more at the same time? Like what do you kind of take away from it when it's over? Well, it changes a little bit. There are times when you're on. Times when you're playing in a big tournament and you're really in control of your game and you're really in control of, you see everything clearly and and you really do enjoy that process and you enjoy, you know, the, the, the strategy, the, the, the delivery um, and the results of what you're doing. And it's enjoyable. And, and when you're hit, hitting shots that you want to hit under pressure, you get a confidence boost and you enjoy it. Ultimately, I mean, you practice so hard for precisely that reason. Um, for me, the Open Championship, I think I played 10 of them. It took me five of them to understand how to play the Open Championship because it's so different to other golf tournaments for me. There was so much attention. There were so many people that want a bit of your time. There, you know, there's so many distractions. And ultimately, I ended up sort of shutting everybody out and going, you know what, I, I really need to just, I'm sorry, 
I'm not going to be available this week. That's what I had to do. And then once I did that and just did what I needed to do for the week, then I started to perform. I think my last three opens, I finished fifth, 10th and 20th, um, which I think is pretty respectable. Uh, the Open at St. George's 03, um, you know, I really should have won that golf tournament. And I, I played probably my best golf ever that week and just couldn't buy a putt uh, on Sunday. And, um, and so I really was enjoying that challenge that year, the year after. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. It was fun and I was driven and and it was great. In 2002, because of the circumstances that I found myself in, and I'd never been obviously in those circumstances, it was uh, an experience that obviously I'd never, you know, uh, dealt with before and it was tough. Um, and I very, very nearly pulled it off. Um, you know, had I, had, you know, I know ifs and buts don't count, but, you know, had I had found the golf ball, uh, you know, I had a relatively straightforward pitch up the green. Um, had I had hit the green with my second shot, you know, it was all over. I'd have had a three shot lead. You know, it would have been tournament over, but that didn't happen. What happened, obviously, was that I made a mistake. And, um, yeah, I, I learned a lot about myself, um, about how to deal with those circumstances. And as I say, the following year, I, I was a different person. And uh, I mean, I remember going out on in 03 and I said to my caddy, Dominic, going out on Sunday, I said, we're three under through eight, we're going to win this. Uh, and I was two under through six, two, two under through five. Uh, I missed... Uh, um, I was trying to through six, seven, I had a four foot putt for birdie, missed it. Eight, I hit driver four and into eight foot, missed it. Nine, I hit three wood wedge into eight foot, missed it. Ten, I hit driver wedge into ten foot, missed it. So I was two under through ten. I could have been four or five under, but I wasn't. I missed the putts when it really counted. And, um, but I was... I was executing the shots tee to green that I needed to execute in order to give myself the chance. And unfortunately, the putter just wasn't working that day. But, but I handled the pressure so much better in 03 than I did in 02 because I really wanted it and I knew what to expect. And that was the difference. Well, uh, we talked about this earlier of uh, some of the, the, the topics that are going on in, in golf now with some rules. And um, the, the first one, I, I, I've been watching this, but for the listeners who probably would like your take, the uh, Lucas Hebert, uh penalty, you had some uh, interesting thoughts on Twitter about that one. And I, I don't know if I've ever seen a Turing pro, he said he just lost his mind, but wasn't thinking. But if the listeners haven't seen it, he sort of used the toe of his wedge to basically improve his lie and what would it be now technically uh is it still called a hazard uh yeah i mean i i'm really i i'm a little lost for words with you know the rna with what they're doing with some of these rulings i mean we've all known for a long time there's too many gray areas in with the rules and how they are enacted and you know it's clear you know whenever if the ball is in sand, you know, um, or a hazard, you know, obviously now you can you can move loose impediments. Okay, now if I was in any golf tournament and a, you know, this is just a traditionalist here. I call over my my partner and say, look, can you take a look at this for me, please? You know, I'm not happy with this. You know, can I pull this away? Are you all right with that? You know, and I finger, finger and thumb, pick up something and put it away because you know you're now allowed to do that apparently. Right. Right. Uh, uh, because because I never ever want anybody to even have the remotest inclination or, or possible idea in the head that I could ever do something wrong. I don't want anyone to ever think that, and I, and I would protect myself as a professional golfer 
to make certain that under those circumstances, if I was looking to to do something like that, I'd make sure someone was watching, right? Um, in those circumstances, where you're using the golf club to drag away what are loose impediments, but at the same time taking sand with you, you know, it's, it's obviously he's improving the, the lie or, or, or line of his golf swing. That's what I saw. Right. So, I mean, dude, what on earth are you doing? I mean, what on earth are you doing? Why would you even allow yourself to to make such a stupid move? You know, it, it, the mind boggles. Uh, I mean, I appreciate these new rules. I mean, you know, this dropping from the knee. I mean, please. I mean, what was wrong with dropping from shoulder height? I mean, I don't get it. I, I, I just, I don't get it. I mean, you, have you tried dropping from, have you actually physically tried doing it yet? Well, unfortunately, it's negative twenty degrees here in Chicago, so it's freezing. But I mean, then how do you how do you do it, right? Like, then the whole Bryson problem is: do you bend your knee, and does that give you an advantage where you can, you know, bend your knee and drop it in the exact spot? I I, I talked to Kalkovecki about this. He was oh. on a couple of weeks ago, and I'm like, do you literally have to now practice these rule changes, right? I mean, and into the sense of how is it the best way to do it within the rules? For him to do that, he's like, I never, it's interesting you brought that up, Jason. I didn't have to think about it, but I literally think I'm going to, so I know how to do it properly. And then there, is there an advantage? He's not saying this, but I'm surmising it from the conversation. Is there an advantage to do it in a certain way inside of those rules where the shoulder heights always made sense to me, right? No matter how tall you are, you don't have to bend. You just drop it. And then the ball has more tendency to bounce from that. To me, it seems now you could kind of half place it from the knee, right? Right. giving you an advantage so i don't i'm i like the randomness yeah. from the higher drop more of real golf like that's what you drop it and it bounces and then the referee says you're in play yeah so you know i i just I, i'm i'm really struggling you know i've just got a new rule book and i just got it literally a couple of days ago and i'm going to sit now over the next couple of weeks and I go through it, you know, with a fine tooth comb, you know, because I need obviously to update, you know, I haven't played tournament golf for 12, 13 years. Um, and, you know, I was pretty decent at the rules previously, but obviously with these new rules, I need to make sure I know what I'm doing. And frankly, you know, something that I suggested and I, for the life of me, I don't understand why this wouldn't be done, but I think, you know, like in formula one, you've got to earn a license to drive in Formula One. And I think, you know, in in golf, I do not understand why the powers that be don't make every player pass a rules examination in order to get a playing card, a tour card. Why don't they do that? If they did that, you remove any doubt that a player doesn't or might not know the rules. You pass an exam test, you get onto the tour. If you fail the exam test, then should you be on tour? Well, then it would also speed up the pace of play too, right? right. They don't have to call a referee in every third hole to say, what do Correct. I do here? Correct. So for the life of me, I don't understand why that, A, that that's not done because that would save an awful lot of problems. Uh, and then you haven't got to rely, you know, this whole, I hate this term, we rely on the integrity of the player. Well, guess what, guys? Wake up. There's a load of people out there playing for an awful lot of money, and not everyone on this planet is honest. Sorry, they're not. And there are one or two instances, as you well know, probably if you've done your research about me, where I've called out one or two players in the past, where it's crystal clear that somebody has not played or abided by the rules. And if, if there was a, a rules exam for every tour player to participate and pass in order to get on the tour, you remove that problem. I've got, uh, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, but that one I thought, I, I don't know if I could say I've ever saw a, a touring professional. And it was even the way he kind of grabbed it. Like he kind of yeah. grabbed it and moved the sand. Like, of course he's going to have a cleaner lie after that. If you're going to do that, you, you pick up the... And, you know, you pick up the loose impediment and you play the ball. It was one of the strangest things I've ever seen for watching God knows how many thousands of hours of golf on television that I kind of went, what? Um, got two more here and I'll get you out. I'm really enjoying the conversation today and thanks for your time. But um, 
I, another one I really want your opinion on is the distance debate. Right. Are you comfortable with the distances the ball is going and how golf is being played, even versus your era, or I'm 45 years old, the way I grew up playing, of less curvature of the ball, you know, you can, you can, it's, it's a different game. And then what's your thoughts on like what they're going to have to do to or what they're talking about doing to uh, St. Andrews for the next open championship of having to put, you know, tee boxes in the new course and oh. you know, trying to make it. So it's not a pitch and putt it's for, for these guys. And, and at what point is it, I don't know what your answer is going to be, but at what point do you maybe have to have a bifurcation of rules where, you know, I can play what I want to because I'm not going to overpower any golf course, relatively speaking, and the pros just have to play with a, a more of a standard golf ball at, uh, that the European tour says you can pick from these three and from each major brand, and here's, here's what we're going to do because we're not going to have every golf course be 8,300 yards. Well, I, I, I 100% agree or, you know, wish that that would be the case. For me, when you look back um, – you know, I remember back in the early days, you know, with the balls that we played, you know, I'm sure the guys back in the 50s and 60s were saying about the guys in the 80s and the 90s, oh, well, they're hitting it far too far. Right. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Ultimately, you know, I, I think that, A, uh, walking more than five miles and, and a certain timeline of playing golf should be limited to a, to a degree, I think when you look at all the great golf courses in this world and the great golf co- uh, holes of this world, they're all short. None of them are long. There are very few long golf holes that pop up on favourite holes ever played. Right? I think that um, you know when you stand uh, on the eighth hole at, at Troon and you got a hundred yards to the hole, and you got the coffin bunker on one side, and you know a nice twenty mile an hour wind. You stand there and go, oh, now what?" And you can hit any club in the bag, you, you literally, to hit the green. Um, so suddenly, distance doesn't matter. I think that this is such a long conversation. Distance. I mean, we could have done an hour on this this one yes. question alone. Yes. Personally, uh, trying to keep it. Sure. I miss the ability to maneuver a golf ball around the golf course. I think to draw it and fade it and work a golf ball around a golf course requires skill. And I think the skill element of the game has been removed over the past five, six years. I think, you know, you're using a golf club like the driver, which is like a frying pan, the size of it. Uh, with a trampoline effect on a golf ball, which which just is unbelievable, it hardly moves now. It's hard to get movement on a golf ball deliberately, um, but it just flies forever. Now, I know I respect entirely, and I agree entirely, that the amateur golfer, 99.99% of golfers, need every bit of help that they can get from the manufacturers. And so those products should absolutely be made available to to all and sundry. But I think at a professional level at the world stage, why where is the problem? Where is the problem to give you a ball that goes at least ten percent less than it goes right now? Where is the problem? I, I don't understand where the problem lies. Why can't we have a professional tour ball, which, you know, as you say, you can, you know, each company, there's the specifics of the ball and you can build your own or, or the tour create their own golf ball. Right. Because this brings, you know, you, you have the argument that Titleist and, and, and Bridgestone and Callaway and, and whatever, they're all going to have the hump because of the investment in tour really well let me give you let me give you one example the best selling driver a few years ago in the world was a cobra driver i think cobra had i don't think they had i think they had maybe one or maybe two drivers in play on the pga tour now it's the best selling driver in the world but how come everyone isn't using it because they're not getting paid to use it is probably the answer i don't know but I don't, know, I don't know what the answer, but, you know, 
the the manufacturer's sales, how much are they affected by what goes on on tour? And it's the ultimate question about sponsorship, isn't it? Is sponsorship, how much of it is actually worthwhile? Where is the return on investment? How can you quantify the return on investment? And, and the answer is you can't. You can get a rough idea of, well, well, you know, if you wanted your name on a television television screen for two hours a day, well, yeah, you can quantify that because what is the cost of putting, you know, you just go to the TV companies, how much does it cost to put Rolex on the screen for two hours? Oh, it's going to cost you, you know, $12,000 for every 30 seconds. You know, I don't know what it is. But, but there's a metric there. Yes, I agree right, with you. There's a metric. Something, right? But where is the problem with having... You know, a, a, you know, a PGA Tour ball. Where is the problem with that? What, a Titleist can turn around and say, to the tour, well, we're not going to supply? Fine, don't supply us. Not a problem. What, is every golfer on the tour now not going to use Titleist equipment because they can't supply the ball? I don't know. You know, it's just, it's an interesting question and it's an interesting argument. It's an interesting discussion. But, the best players, the best golfers in the world, and the best courses in the world, in my opinion, um, and it's only my opinion, um, aren't 7,500 yards long. Um, and I think when you go back to watching and listening, you know, if you watch any of the telecasts back from the 80s or the 90s, even, Ryder Cups and stuff like that, how guys used to work a golf ball around a golf course, Ray Floyd, you know, how used to work the golf ball. All of them. I mean, I think there was a skill to it. Now they stand there. They're athletes. They're unbelievable athletes now. And power to them. You know, they've worked extremely hard on their physique. And they're extremely strong and powerful and all the rest of it. And they stand there and they belt it 340, 350, 360 yards. And you go, okay, you hit it a long way. And what's the penalty for hitting it offline? Oh, that's right. There isn't one. Yeah, or it's so minuscule. It's the, the the gain you gain from the distance is not possibly worth the was it right. one tenth of a stroke into the rough. So you're better off to pound and gouge. It's right how they all play anymore. Yeah, it's. So I, it, I, I I think as a viewer too, I would like to see guys um, hit five irons or four irons into a par four every now and then. Absolutely. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't right. Like a 480 yard hole for those guys is still driver Drops. wedge. Yeah. It's crazy. And I mean, I remember being, you know, I remember when you, anything over 440 yards and you were thinking, geez, I've got hit wood in here, you know, as a yeah. kid. You know? Right, right. Well, that's gone now, all, altogether gone. And, and, you know, I'm hitting it further now than I've ever done. I'm 50 years of age next month, you know. I'm hitting it like 290, you know. I, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, my last one I got here for you is just, and we've, caught, uh, we've talked about this a little bit of some of these characters that you've played with on the European tour. So I, I've got a couple we already kind of went over, so I, I've just got a few more. And if you just have a quick couple thoughts about yeah. these players, and, uh, and then we'll get you out of here. And I really appreciate your time today. So no Colin Montgomery. <laughs> yes. What would you like to know? Just, you know, obviously he's, he's – Loved, he's hated. The record is what it is for itself of how good he was for that long. So as a competitor, he played some, some. This is my observation: some damn good golf, and people yeah. either love him or they 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 hate him. And in the states anymore, we've kind of warmed up to him on the Champions Tour. He's kind of well liked now over here. People yeah. like Monty. So just as you know, as a competitor playing against him, you know what what sort of what's your thoughts of how how he did it for that period of time for being that good for that long. I mean, that's the most impressive thing I see of his game of to win the order of merit as many times as he did is it's crazy, stupid, good, you know, for that extended period. He was uh, an incredible competitor. And I think that's the most important word to use in his description. Um, he had incredible self-belief um, literally uh, had no respect uh, or no consideration of any other player in terms of how good they were. He just never would, you know, he he was the best in his mind and he was always going to be the best. And it didn't matter what anyone else was going to do, he was going to be the best. And, and, you know, so from a mental aspect, he had incredible self-confidence. 
Um, he had a game which was very unique, very individual. You'd never, ever in a million years teach that golf swing, um, but he made it work. Um, and he, you know, is wants to win very badly. Um, and I think that that's really uh, as bad, uh, uh, as kind a compliment as you're going to get from me on, on Colin Montgomery. Um, he and I had one or two run-ins, as you probably well yeah. know. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately for me, uh, and it's it's my problem, it's my issue, um, I hold this game very high in, in its respect of how it's played and, and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, for me, I think that at times he didn't give the game or the rest of the field the respect that it deserves um, by his actions. That being said, um, I played with him on a number of occasions and there was no question as a, as a golfer, he was phenomenally good. Next player, please. <laughs> <laughs> Darren Clark. Big D. Big DC. Um, DC is, um, uh, was, again, um, very much a similar mindset, um, similar mindset, um, very competitive, very driven uh, by success, um, more concerned about what he looked like and what car he drove and quite materialistic um as a as a presence as a as a person um but also you know you know uh, very hard headed and 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 um driven but also with with Darren which is what you didn't get with Colin Darren liked to have a good time as well and you know there's no it's no secret he enjoys a pint he enjoys a cigar um he used to smoke like a trooper um and I think he had a very, an admirable and a very good career. Um, put some good trophies on the, on the, on the, you know, in the cabinet, um, including the British Open. And no one can take that, you know, his performances away from him. Um, but a, a different, a different character uh, from from Colin. Padraig Harrington. Harrington is one of the most, I think, Padraig. I think he's one of the most hardworking guys um, that I've ever come across in golf. Um, I hope, you know, if he ever listened to this, I hope he'd take this the right way um, because I mean it as a compliment. Um, he was um, not the most talented guy of the guys that grew, I, I grew up with, um, naturally talented, um, but boy... Did he get the best out of himself? He he reminds me a little bit of Langer, in so much as he never leaves a stone unturned. He works incredibly hard, and um, you know, again, got a phenomenal, you know, record, um, phenomenal record. Um, got a great deal of respect for him uh, as a golfer. Uh, I know him particularly well. Um, but like I said, I've got a tremendous amount of respect for him as a golfer. Um, his recent golf swings have, 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 like, you know, I don't think my eyes have been quite that wide in a long time. Um, there's some of the mood he makes, you're like, well, what on earth are you doing? But, you know, he, he thinks it works and, and he's making it work from time to time, and which is incredible. So, you know, um, yeah, got a lot of respect for him. And my last one, and this one's going to be off center here a little bit, but this this guy is an interesting character, at least in the states. He's, uh, he's got a, like a little bit of a cult following. Yarmo Sandlin. I don't know if you have any experience <laughs> with him. Of uh, there's some great Yarmo st stories from guys I've talked to, and obviously the the Phil Mickelson Yarmo story was fantastic. So I'll I'll, I'll end the podcast. Is there any good Yarmo Sandlin stories or or, sure. uh, or uh, comments on this player? Yarmo, um, he is definitely comes from a different planet. Um, Yarmo is some character. Uh, I, he's one of the biggest characters I think I ever knew on the tour, uh, just for being out there, man. I mean, he was just, 
strange. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we like him, right? Like he's he's, he's yeah, Armo Sandlin, right? Like he's yeah. a one off. He he is he's pretty unique. Uh, yeah, he used to wear some funky gear, and uh, you know he wore some funky Oakleys once, and actually won a golf tournament in them. I think. Uh, I remember that. Yeah. Um, and he he um, yeah, he, he's got a great sense of humour. Uh, quite dry. Um, he's a funny dude. I mean, I bumped into him last year, I think, at a senior tour event over here and said hi. And he says, when are you joining? And I said, oh, hopefully next year. He says, he said, good, it'd be good to see you. You know, he's a great guy. Um, funky golf swing. Um, regularly turned up with some strange looking golf clubs of different lengths and uh, yeah, some very strange trousers he used to wear. Um, you know, I think he once he wore a pair of fur trousers, which I think was the the one that pushed him over the edge. Yeah, uh, it's going to be fun to catch up with those guys next year. Um, like I say, it's a long time since I've seen them and spent time with them, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping that you know it's going to be really good fun. Well, we really look forward to you know watching this. Uh you know, kind of 2.0 happen again of, of getting out there and competing and going up against the guys you used to go up against. I, I can't wait to see the progress and, and, and how it unfolds and would love to have you back on, you know, at the end of the season, once you kind of get your feet wet with it again and give us an assessment of what it was like competing again at a really high level and, and, you know, playing professional golf. So I was really looking forward to the conversation and it, it truly lived up to it. Uh, we're rooting for you over here, and we look forward to watching the progress. Well, it's been it's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, this is probably the first interview I've done in thirteen or fourteen years. So, pardon me if I was a little hesitant here or there, but uh, I enjoyed talking to you, Jay. And uh, yeah, I look forward to coming back someday. Sounds great. Thanks for your time. You're welcome.